My name is Elizabeth Butler, and I'm the grant manager for the Duwamish Green, Cedar Sammamish, Nahomish, and Yakima Watershed. As you prepare to apply for surfboard funding, you'll want to shape your project for success as our dollars are limited. So what does a good salmon or steelhead recovery project look like? Target projects that protect or restore critical salmonid habitat and address a lead entity strategy or recovery plan. And you need to be able to put the funds to work quickly. Projects should be completed within two to three years of funding approval. You need to apply locally, so it's important to get to know your salmon recovery lead entity coordinators and pay attention to their schedules, their funding allocations, and their ranking criteria. Each watershed is unique. While Surfboard doesn't have a maximum grant request, you'll want to stay within the lead entity allocation. And we typically require 15% of your total project cost to be matched, but we'll get into exceptions later. Next slide, please. So what do you need to know and where can you find it? On the RCO website, each grant program webpage should have all the guidance, forms, manuals, and information you'll need to be a successful applicant. You just need to use it. And as many of you know, last year, our salmon webpage um, was updated. Actually, our whole website was. And the manuals for each program are always located in that upper right-hand corner of the grants um, website. Um, you're going to want to read it. It is short, especially if you focus on those um, chapters for grant application and implementation guidelines. We update the manual every year um, for the coming grant round, and so this one is fresh. Um, and depending on your project type, you'll also need to be familiar with the manuals for restoration and acquisition. So take the time to check out these resources and contact your grant manager if you have questions. Next slide, please. So like I said, our new web website's been online for about a year now, and many of you are familiar with it. If not, make sure you remember to scroll down uh, the Salmon Grants webpage. There's a lot of information there. You'll find links to manual 18 appendices, like our application checklist, and the details on their surfboard design deliverable requirements. And these are really great to be able to attach to your RFPs when you're seeking design consultants, so they're clear about what the requirements of each of our deliverables are. Next slide, please. Who's eligible to apply? As you can see by this list, almost any organization or individual may apply for a salmon recovery grant. Even private landowners may apply for restoration projects on their own property, but there could be tax implica implications. So often um, that's not the road that people choose to go down. Federal agencies and for-profit companies and organizations are not eligible applicants, but no worries. If you've got a great restoration project idea on land owned by the federal government or by a for-profit entity, you'll just need to find an eligible applicant to sponsor the project and get the landowner to sign the landowner agreement. For surfboards, state agencies are eligible, but they must have a local partner to provide their own matching funds or an in-kind contribution to the project. Next slide, please. So we're trying to recover salmon, steelhead, and orca, and there is a sense of urgency here. If you're funded, we expect you to accomplish your project in two to three years. When RCO and the surfboard ask the legislature for additional funding every biennium, the best way to show them that we do indeed need more dollars is to have expended our previous appropriation on recovery projects that move the dial. If you're not ready to begin construction in the summer of 2022, which is about a year from when funding will be awarded, please wait and apply next year. Next slide, please. Surfboard funds four types of projects or a combination of these project types. Next slide, please. The next few slides will focus on acquisition. We fund many projects that purchase real property to protect habitat or for habitat restoration. And acquisition is forever. It is in perpetuity. Leases are not eligible for surfboard funding. Grant recipients must meet long-term obligations and adhere to specific restrictions on how property can be used beyond the term of the grant agreement. Buildings may be funded, but unless they're benefiting salmon habitat, they must be moved off the property or be demolished. And RCO does not allow restrictions, covenants, or encumbrances that conflict with the salmon recovery program goals, so applicants should assess their target properties with this in mind. Next slide, please. And if you're looking to assemble property from multiple owners for habitat protection or restoration, consider proposing a multi-site acquisition project. The property should be contiguous and each parcel should contain similar conservation values. The large map on the left shows progress made in just a few years by King County, 
Originally a series of privately owned piano key parcels along the Point Higher Drift Cell on Bastion Island, the shaded yellow parcels are now part of King County's natural area, and the blue hashtags indicate conservation easements. For multi-site acquisition projects, you'll need to provide a map of the geographic envelope and a prioritization strategy for acquisition, so we know which is your target parcel in what order. Next slide, please. So you're planning to apply for an acquisition project? Please familiarize yourself with and use the RCO Acquisition Toolkit. It will help you navigate the project requirements and position you for a prompt escrow payment or reimbursement of your purchase price. Next slide, please. You'll want to have the most recent acquisition projects manual at your fingertips. The RCO updates manual three regularly. I think the most recent version on the website today is from August 2018, but there's an update underway, so there should be a new edition out shortly. There's not enough time right now today to unpack everything you need to know about acquisition projects in this workshop, so we really need you to read it. And feel free to reach out to your grant manager for support. Knowing what is expected will help you budget and plan your surfboard project proposal accordingly. Next slide, please. Here's a common misstep. Any project receiving funding from the state is required to follow the Uniform Real Property Acquisition Procedures. What does that entail? You need to send a letter or email to the landowner to let them know they are not required to sell their property. Condemnation isn't eligible for surfboard. You need to determine if there are tenants, business or residential, and if there are, you're required to provide relocation assistance per the Uniform Relocation Act. And you need to send a letter outlining the fair market value of the property, just compensation, as determined by your reviewed appraisal. Documentation of these steps will be required before we can pay your acquisition costs. Next slide, please. If you're funded and before we issue the project agreement, we'll need a preliminary title report and a title review checklist that notes which encumbrances will be removed prior to purchase. You might wanna check title before you initiate the surfboard grant application to be sure the property is a good fit. Encumbrances on title need to align with salmon recovery. So for example, if you're purchasing a riverside parcel for floodplain restoration, make sure there isn't a flood protection easement on that levy you wanna remove. Unless you can work to have that easement extinguished, that property isn't a good fit for surfboard funding. Next slide, please. As a general rule, don't start project activities before your grant agreement is signed. Even if your project ranks at the top of your lead entity's funding list, you'll want to check in with your grants manager before you start work. If you do need to acquire property before you've gotten your grant agreement, we can help you, but we need notice. We can issue a waiver of retroactivity when property acquisition can't wait, for example, if the property is being listed for sale. At least 30 days before closing, you'll need to make a request by sending an email with details about the property, along with the landowner acknowledgement form, the voluntary acquisition notice, and preliminary title checklist. You can see manual three, pages 27 through 28 for details and contact your grant manager. Next slide, please. For those of you that might be working with a land trust to purchase the property before transferring it to the long-term owner and habitat steward, you'll need to know about RCO's partnership policy. It's not intuitive. So work with your grants manager and make sure the partner gets a waiver of retroactivity before closing as it's their purchase that will be subject to the RCO policies and reimbursed with grant funds. Next slide, please. Acquiring property with RCO funding forever unites your organization with RCO in perpetuity. Accepting surfboard grant funding requires a long-term commitment to keep the primary focus of the site consistent with the Salmon Recovery Funding Program. Once a project is complete, you'll need to steward the property according to your stewardship plan or for some restoration projects, your landowner agreement. Incompatible use of acquisition property can cause a compliance issue. Of course, there are exceptions for acts of nature and vandalism. Next slide, please. So please make sure the RCO grant will only be used to acquire property designated for salmon recovery forever. Construction of buildings like environmental learning centers, libraries, firehouses, schools, even greenhouses for propagation of native plants are not allowed on surfboard funded property. Installation of utility infrastructure, even recreational trail development can cause a compliance issue in the future. We've seen these situations arise arise and the conversion and property replacement process is onerous 
You'll want to avoid a future conversion. So plan ahead and carve out incompatible and ineligible uses from the scope of your project. That means adjust your legal description, your map, project costs, and deed of right to target the salmon recovery habitat. Anticipate future needs like expansion of existing roads or well sites or other utilities and access easements for neighboring properties. Work with your grant manager. We're here to help. My name is Amy Barr, as was mentioned earlier, and I am going to be talking about the remaining eligible project types for surf board applications. I am the grant manager for Island, Lower Columbia, and the Stilla Guamish area. So planning projects include all of the items listed on this slide, like assessments, feasibility and scoping stu studies, and preliminary and final designs of a project that would be constructed in a later phase. Assessments must use state dollars only, and I'll get to what this means in a later slide. All planning projects need to be completed within two years. They must lead to a project design, and they should be identified within the recovery plan. All planning projects must meet Manual 18 Appendix D requirements. Next slide, please. If you plan to carry out an assessment or inventory project, you must meet the following requirements and limitations. These include, it needs to be a precursor to implement restoration projects. It needs to meet a high priority data gap within an identified recovery plan. It should demonstrate a need for surfboard funds. And most importantly, it requires a letter of support from the region. Next slide, please. A little bit about assessments. Assessment projects that do not result in a site-specific design are eligible only for state funding. In the Puget Sound and Hood Canal, assessment projects must use PSAR, that's the Puget Sound Acquisition and Restoration Funds, only. Since PSAR funds are only available in even grant rounds, you need to check with your local lead entity to determine if they have any available unallocated PSAR funds from a previous biennium before starting an application. Applicants outside of the Puget Sound and Hood Canal region are eligible for state surfboard funding and may apply for assessment funds in any grant round but each region is subject to a $200,000 cap for all assessments in any given year. Regions may submit more than one project, but the total amount, not including the match, may not exceed the $200,000 regional allocation. Next slide, please. If you're thinking about combining an assessment and a design, please consider the funding limits when you develop this type of project. To avoid the limits on state funding with assessments, site-specific designs must make up the majority of the project. If you look at the graph, you can see that the site-specific design is larger than the assessment piece of the project. Due to the wide variety of assessment projects, the definition and eligibility will be determined on a project-by-project -project basis. So please discuss with your grant manager early if you might consider this type of combination project. To be eligible for no match planning project, you must, you must produce at minimum a preliminary design, which meets, of course, Manual 18 Appendix D requirements. Next slide, please. Speaking of, this is Appendix D, a small graph of it, or picture of it. This provides a guidance for required design deliverables. Depending on the design stage, sorry about that, looks like there was a little delay. This is the photo for the Appendix D. This provides a guidance for required design deliverables depending on the design stage of your project. These requirements reflect best engineering practices to ensure that funded projects successfully meet salmon recovery goals. Please read Appendix D to understand the expectations. Our review ensures the project consistency with the original intent. Discovering issues at the last minute can lead to project delays and increased costs. Check in with your grant manager with the design changes to ensure that things stay on track. Restoration projects must submit their conceptual, preliminary, and final designs to RCO for review prior to moving on to the next level 
of design or construction. Our RCO will require as-built drawings if the completed project differs from the final design. Next slide, please. There is no match option. The no match option facilitates the design of identified projects, especially complex projects that take time to plan and negotiate. If your project does not meet all of the required criteria for no match, then you must provide a 15% match. And you can see in the graph that what is required for a match. Next slide, please. We'll talk a little bit about restoration. For, your, for RCO grant purposes, restoration means that the project helps the original function of the site, it improves the habitat, it allows for the natural ecosystem, and it is self-sustaining. Next slide, please. You'll find addi additional information about eligible restoration projects in our restoration and in our restoration projects and procedures manual, which also has policies, and that was updated in 2018. Next slide, please. Here are some examples of past projects that were funded by RCO. These include in-stream passage projects, such as upgrading road crossings with bridges, culverts, or roughened channels, removing barriers and creating fishways, in-stream diversions, which can include screening fish from a water diversion, water conveyance systems, and fish bypass back to streams. Next slide, please. Standalone riparian stewardship projects are eligible even if they did not receive previous surfboard funding. These types of projects include floodplain habitat, where you add large wood, reconnect side channels, remove setback level levees and bank revetments, enhance fish habitat, or minimize non-natural materials. This also includes riparian habitat planting native trees and shrubs, removing noxious weeds, riparian stewardship, and installing livestock barriers. Next slide, please. Other projects would include upland habitat, controlling erosion and sediment on roads and steep slopes, installing livestock fencing, and improving irrigation efficiency. It would include estuarine and marine nearshore, dike breaches, removing bulkheads, reconstructing reconstruct tide channels, removing invasives, and improving or removing tide gates. We recognize that most grant projects include restoration elements and efforts were not, will not always be on a large scale. The majority of restoration activities are on a much smaller scale. Next slide, please. A final couple of things to keep in mind. Surfboard's definition of the preliminary design. For this grant program, restoration projects seeking more than $250,000 must provide the design report and engineering plans that you'll use to apply for construction permits. This is a detailed level of design. For many projects, it is roughly about a 60% design. But rather than specify a percent design, we leave that flexible. But what you provide to the surfboard in your surfboard application should align with your JARPA permit application. Next slide, please. And lastly, if you're applying for an intensively monitor, in, a, in an intensively monitored watershed, the instructions for this can be found in Manual 18. Please talk with your lead entity if you are considering a restoration project in an intensively monitored watershed. Uh, next slide, please. Combination projects require your grant manager to set them up. You can't pick them from the list. So if you plan on doing a combination that is listed on this slide, please contact your grant manager and we'll help you out with that. 
I'm going to cover a little bit about regional monitoring projects. Uh, if you could advance the slide, please. Please note that there is limited funding available to support regional monitoring projects. If you would like to propose a monitoring project, coordinate with your local lead entity coordinator to learn about available funding and if your project is a good fit. Eligible projects must address a high priority information need, complete ongoing monitoring, and use the data collection and management protocols consistent with other monitoring occurring in the region. Next slide, please. Kendall, if you could advance. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, great. Applicants must ask the regions to complete a regional monitoring project certification form for you to attach to PRISM with your application. Application due dates are the same as the other surfboard applications, but they will be reviewed by the surfboard monitoring panel rather than the surfboard review panel who review our project applications. If you have any questions about regional monitoring applications, please contact Keith DeBlonica. His information is listed on this slide. Next slide, please. It's important to remind everyone of what's not eligible for salmon recovery funding. This is not an exhaustive list. If you are unsure, please contact your grant manager. This also applies to matching funds. If it's not eligible for reimbursement, then it's not eligible for match. I'm Kay Caramile. I'm also a grant manager with the Salmon Recovery Funding Board. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about the grant process as well as the application. Next slide, please. This is a general overview of the grant application process, but do keep in mind that your local lead entity will likely have some additional steps in here in order to accommodate their local review and ranking process. Now, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is contact your local lead entity. And the reason for that is that each lead entity is unique. They all have their own schedule. They all have their own process. So it's important to talk with them directly to find out what you need to do when. If you don't know who your lead entity coordinator is, by all means, contact any grant manager and we can help you figure that out. Now, most lead entities will start off with what's called a letter of intent. And that letter of intent has you provide some general information about your project. And by doing that, the lead entity can use that to determine whether or not your project is a good fit for the local salmon recovery strategy. If they determine that it is, um, you'll be invited to submit a complete application in PRISM. And do keep in mind that RCO no longer accepts draft applications. We only accept full, complete applications. Now, once you submit that application, it's going to be reviewed by the local lead entity. It's going to be reviewed by your RCO grant manager, as well as by the surfboard review panel or the surfboard monitoring panel if it's a monitoring project. And then you'll be asked to attend site visits. Now, normally those site visits would be in person out at your project site. However, due to COVID-19, we're anticipating that all site visits are gonna be virtual this year. And so you'll likely be asked to participate in some sort of webinar um, presentation. Now, the purpose of the site visits is for you to have an opportunity to explain your project but also to familiarize the reviewers with your project site. So since this is virtual, um, you want to make sure that you include a lot of photographs of the site, maybe some video, drone footage, something really to, to give the reviewers a good image of what your site's like and what the, the problems are. And the site visits are also an opportunity for the reviewers to ask questions of you to make sure that they fully understand your proposal. The attendees for the site visits are gonna include your local identity. It'll include two members from the Surfboard Technical Review Panel, and it'll include um, your RCO grant manager. Now, although only two review panel members attend the site visits, they do all get together as a group afterwards and talk about all projects and then prepare a comment form. Now that comment form is gonna include some general comments about your project. Um, it may have some questions for you to, to answer. Um, it may even include some recommendations for improving your project. And it's also gonna include a status of your project. There's four different statuses at the stage of the game. So your project may be clear, meaning that the review panel has no technical concerns with the project. 
your project may be conditioned. Um, a typical condition might be that although we have no technical concerns, we'd like to review your preliminary designs before you move on to final designs. That's a really common um, condition. Another status might be need more information. And if that's the case, um, it'll be followed by a list of information that they'd like you to provide. And lastly, the status might be project of concern. If, you're, if your project is a designated a project of concern, that means that the review panel has some very serious um, technical uh, concerns regarding specifically the likelihood of success and benefit to salmon. If your project is clear, you're basically done with the application process up until the lead entity ranking. Um, you may have some minor comments to address from the, the grant manager, the lead entity, or the review panel, um, but you're basically done at this point. If your project's not clear, so if you have a need more information designation, you're conditioned, or it's a project of concern, you'll have an opportunity to actually have that uh, in person, or sorry, well, over the phone, um, interview with the review panel to make sure you fully understand what their concerns are. And then you can submit a revised application in PRISM Online. The review panel will then take that revised application, they'll prepare a final comment form, and at that point your designation, um, your statuses will either be cleared, conditioned, or project of concern. And then I show here that the lead entity ranking occurs after that point. However, in reality, it may occur before, during, or after the review panel review. And then in September, the SERP board will approve the funding list. Next slide, please. So as you can tell, there's a lot of players involved in the process. So your project's actually undergoing three concurrent reviews. One of these reviews is by the lead entity. They're looking at the project to determine whether or not it's consistent with the local and regional strategy. They're providing some technical review, and they're also the ones responsible for ranking your project within the lead entity. Your RCO grant manager, we're reviewing the projects to make sure that they're eligible for SERP board funding and that you've met all the application requirements. And then either the SERP board technical review panel or the monitoring panel, if it's a monitoring project, they're evaluating the technical merits of the project, specifically with regards to salmon benefits and likelihood of success. Next slide, please. So next, I want to go over some key dates. Um, I did mention that every lead entity is unique. They all have their own schedule, but there are some dates that are common to all. And the thing to keep in mind is that there's actually two tracks of project review, and that's based upon the timing of your site visit. So if your site visit occurs in February or March, you fall under track one. If your site visits occur in April or May, you fall under track two. So for those of you with site visits in February and March, you can expect to receive your first review panel comment forms on April 2nd, and the optional phone call with the review panel will occur on April 12th. For those of you with site visits in April or May, you can expect your first review panel comment forms on June 4th, and the optional review panel phone call will be on June 9th and 10th. No matter which track you're in, um, the final applications are due to RCO by noon on June 28th, but do keep in mind that your local identity may have an earlier deadline to accommodate their ranking process. Your review panel will review your final applications and provide the, the final comment forms on July 22nd, and then the SERP board are going to be awarding funding on September 22nd and 3rd. So now Josh and I are going to um, talk about the application itself. Next slide, please. So if you're planning to submit a surfboard application, um, one thing I do recommend, and, and Elizabeth already mentioned this, was make sure you read section three of manual 18. It's only eight pages long, um, but it provides a lot more information than what we can present today. It provides some tips for success. It also provides a link to the application checklist, which we'll talk about more later. The lead entity website, um, that's where you're going to be able to find information on the schedule and the lead entity's process, but also their evaluation criteria that they use to rank all their projects within their, their watershed. The RCO website, Elizabeth again already presented this. This is where you're going to find all of the required application materials. And if you're a successful applicant, this is where you'll find information on how to manage your grant. And then lastly, and um, probably underutilized resource for you is PRISM itself. 
Um, PRISM is the database in which you're going to be entering and submitting your application, but you can actually use that to um, search keywords to try to find a project that might be similar to yours. And you can see how other people have responded to questions in the past, and that can be really helpful. Next slide, please. So if you don't already have a PRISM account, you're gonna to wanna to get one. Some people will use a coworker's account if they don't have their own, but that often leads to access issues later on. So I do encourage you to just go ahead and get your own. Um, it only takes a couple of minutes. You do it right from the RCO website and Cass is gonna show you how to do that later on in the presentation. Once you have an account, you need a project number. And for that, you're gonna to wanna to talk to your lead entity coordinator. The reason I say that is though, Although you're going to have to enter and complete your application in PRISM Online, you're not able to actually start your application in PRISM. You're gonna to need to start your application in a parallel database that's called the Salmon Recovery Portal. This used to be called the Habitat Work Schedule, so you may know it by that name. Now the Salmon Recovery Portal is a um, database that the lead entities use to manage their salmon recovery information within their watershed. And by starting your application in the salmon recovery portal, it creates a link between the two databases. So that way um, you're not gonna have to later add information to both databases. You just simply add it to one and it'll appear in both. Similarly, um, this helps lead entities out in order to help them with our long-term strategy and recovery plan tracking. So to start the application in the salmon recovery portal, you'll enter some real basic information about your project. Um, it'll then um, create that PRISM project number and you can move forward in PRISM with the rest of your application. Now, most lead entities will start that initial process themselves and simply give you a PRISM project number to use. But each lead entity is different. Some of them may ask you to make this initial step yourself. And so it's important to talk with your lead entity coordinator to find out what you need to do. Next slide, please. So once you have your PRISM project number, you're free to go ahead and complete and submit your application in PRISM Online. Now, my advice is to be thorough. You don't wanna assume that the reviewers have any prior knowledge whatsoever of your site, its history, or the problems that you're trying to address. When you're close to a project, it's really easy to forget that others don't know what you do. And so it's, it's important for you as the applicant to take that step back in order to explain the context of the project so the, the reviewers really get the whole story. You can have an amazing project, but the reviewers don't understand what you plan to do, why it's important to do it, and why this is a strategic location in which to do it. You're gonna get a lot of questions and that amazing project could become a project of concern simply because your application isn't clear. Follow the application checklist. I mentioned this earlier. Um, your application checklist lists all the required material that you need to attach to PRISM, and it provides a link to all the forms you're gonna need. PRISM is designed to check for certain attachments, but it can't check for all attachments. That's what your application checklist is for. So be sure to use that and make sure you don't miss anything. Don't procrastinate. Um, good piece of advice for all of us at all times, I'm sure. But um, for your surfboard application, it's, it is really important. Um, your application is, is um, pretty lengthy. Um, there's a lot of questions to respond to. Some of those responses are gonna take you some time to really think through carefully. Um, some of the required attachments are gonna take some time to develop, such as your landowner acknowledgement forms, your fiscal data form, your application authorization form. Those can take some time to work with others in order to um, complete the form. So it's important to not wait to the last minute. Another thing with regards to procrastination is that um, PRISM is a database. If you're not familiar with it, it'll take you some time to get used to it. And also it sometimes goes down. Uh, usually it's only down for an hour or two every now and then. It's down for a, a day or two. And you don't want that to happen like the day before your applications are due. If you have any questions whatsoever, contact your grant manager. That's what we're here for. We can help you with PRISM. We can help you understand and interpret some of the questions that are being asked. Um, so give us a call anytime. And most importantly, be sure to submit your application by the lead entity deadline, which will be at least two weeks prior to your site visits. Next slide, please. 
Site visits we talked about already. Um, now, following your site visits, you're going to receive comments from the grant manager, the review panel, as well as from the lead entity. And you'll likely need to update your application based upon that feedback. Now, in the past, all the comment forms were provided to you via email or other separate documentation. Um, but in 2020, we did merge the comment process into um, your application itself. And on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see all the different tabs of the application that you'll be filling out. And the two that are highlighted at the bottom are the ones that you don't fill out, but these are the ones that we provide you. So the, the one titled grant manager comments is obviously where we provide our comments when we review your application. And the review panel um, provides their comments through the one labeled review comments. In addition to that, you may also find your lead entity comments there. However, most lead entities still do that outside of PRISM. A few are starting to use um, PRISM itself. So if you need to respond, well, if you have any comments from the review panel, you need to respond to them. And you'll do that right in the same module. So you would click on the tab called review comments. You'll see the comments there. Underneath each comment, there'll be a box for you to provide a direct response to each individual comment. But do keep in mind that if your responses introduce corrections or new information, you want to be sure to update the rest of your application so that it aligns with these changes and you don't have any conflicts. And important, um, the revised final applications are due to RCO by noon on June 28th. But again, your local lead entity will likely have an earlier deadline because most lead entities are going to want to see those final applications before they rank their projects, which may be well before June 28th. Next slide, please. So next, we're going to get into some of the application material itself. And we're not going to get into every single aspect of your application, but we did want to highlight some key items that often trip people up. And the project description is one of those. Um, your description is probably the most read portion of your application. It's included in your project agreements with RCO. It's included in press releases, the NOAA reporting, and it's also the most visible aspect of your project to the general public. And because of all that, it's important that it be both clear and complete. You want to be sure to answer the basic questions of who, what, where, and why. And and on the screen in front of you is a really good example from a 2020 application. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I did want to start off. Um, the Mid Sound Fisheries Enhancement Group, in partnership with the Kitsap Conservation District, and two private landowners will complete preliminary and then final designs to restore a historic barrier embayment estuary connected to a small perennial stream. That very clearly explains who's doing the project and what they plan to do. They then go on to talk about where the project is located. They provide some additional design information about what they're trying to accomplish. And then they describe the anticipated benefits to salmon and that's the why. Another thing to keep in mind with regards to your project description is that the only parts of the application that are seen by NOAA, and they do see every single project that comes through here, the only parts they see are the project description and the project metrics. They don't see your project proposal. They don't see any other aspect of your application, just those two items. Now, as a result, it's important that the two of them are consistent. You wanna make sure that your project description mentions every work type that you select in your application and vice versa. You wanna make sure that you're selecting work types that reflect everything that you mentioned in your, your description. If we grant managers, as we review your application, notice discrepancies, um, you know, your, your project description said that you're gonna do a levy setback, but you didn't happen to pick levy modification as a work type, we're gonna possibly return your application to um, have some corrections made. Next slide, please. Your project proposal, this used to be a separate attachment in PRISM, but in 2020, we merged this also into PRISM. So all the questions are there. They've just been reorganized and revised. So the thing to keep in mind is that your project proposal is still the core of your application. This is still your sales pitch. You wanna make sure that you provide all the relevant details so reviewers can clearly understand what you're doing and why. And the thing I wanna stress is that you wanna pay very careful attention to the character limits on each response. In the figure in front of you to the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see um, for this particular 
question, it says description is required in italics zero to 3000 characters. That means that you have a 3000 character limit on your response to this question. And as you start typing a response, it's actually gonna start counting the characters to help you stay on track. This is really important to pay attention to because as soon as you hit 3000 for this particular question, you're cut off. You won't be able to provide any additional response. Something that might be of, of help to you also is um, you can, if, especially if you're working as part of a team, you can download the questions from the RCO website as a Word document. Then you can work completely offline, trade the document back and forth until you've finalized your responses and then simply cut and paste them into PRISM. But the do, do keep in mind that if you do that, um, you wanna pay even extra attention to those character limits because it's really easy to cut and paste and not realize that PRISM just cut off half of your response. So when you do that, definitely check and make sure after you press the save button that it's, it's saved your complete response. Next slide, please. So one of the things we hear most often from the review panel is that projects need very clear goals and objectives. And these goals and objectives not only inform the reviewers, but they're really intended to inform you um, to help inform your design decisions and also to help you evaluate your project success. Now your application specifically asks you what are your project goals and what are your project objectives? And it also provides examples of each of those to help you work that out. And for goals, the thing to keep in mind is that your goals are not what you plan to do, but rather what you plan to accomplish by doing it. It's the desired outcome and the species and life stages that you anticipate will benefit from the project. So for instance, your goal would not be to install five log jams on the Tucannon River. The goal would rather be um, you want to reconnect a half mile of Tucannon River to a historic floodplain in order to increase overwintering habitat for the benefit of juvenile steelhead. That's your goal statement. Your, the five log jams that you plan on, on constructing, those are simply the tool you're using to achieve that goal. Next slide, please. Project objectives, um, they support and refine goals and break them down to smaller steps. And each objective needs to be quote unquote smart. Um, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. And an example objective um, to the goal I just mentioned might be that um, you want to increase the flood-prone area by three acres within a half-mile reach of the Tucannon River at the two-year flow event by 2025. That's a very specific target. It's measurable, it's achievable, it's relevant, and it's time-bound. Again, um, there are examples of your goals and objectives directly in PRISM um, as you fill out your application. And there's also a link to chapter four of the Stream Habitat Restoration Guidelines where you can find additional information about writing your goals and objectives and some examples. So next I'm gonna turn things over to Josh and he's gonna keep going on the application. Um, next slide, please. Thank you, Kay. Hi, everybody. Josh uh, Lambert, I am grant manager for Hood Canal Region and some of the southern Puget Sound lead entities like Nisqually, Riot 13, and 14. So I'm going to continue uh, with the application with work sites and properties. These are important building blocks of your application. Um, they affect how you will represent your project's metrics and costs, and ultimately the reimbursement process, since you will need to track and report your costs by work site or property. The worksite also provides the geographic location of your project in PRISM. Every project requires at least one worksite, and with the exception of certain broad scale assessments, every worksite requires at least one property. Properties are based on land ownership. The number of worksites to include is not always clear, though. If you're doing a single activity on one landowner's property, the answer is simple one worksite plus one property. If you're doing one or more activities that encompasses multiple adjacent landowner properties, for instance, the example de depicted in the right-hand figure of the screen, it makes sense to have a single worksite with multiple properties. Each property will represent a different landowner. Do the requirements with RCO's federal funders, NOAA, if you are proposing work on geographically distinct areas more than a half mile apart, like the example depicted in the left-hand figure of your screen, 
you should create separate worksites for those areas, and each worksite should have a separate property for each landowner, even if it is the same landowner. If the work areas are closer than half a mile, but not adjacent, talk with us, your grant manager, so we can help you craft the best scenario. It's easier to set up right to begin with than to amend an active agreement later on. And please keep in mind for restoration and design projects, you will need to track and report costs separately for each work site. For acquisition projects, you will need to track and report costs separately for each property. I'll discuss that more in the next slide. Next slide, please, Kendall. Work, work types reflect the various types of eligible project activities you plan to complete and determine which metrics RCO collects. Metrics are the quantitative estimation of your work type. You want to select the work types that best fit your project. And remember that work types are not always related to on the ground work. People sometimes forget to select cultural resources, permitting, or admin and engineering, which are common to most projects. So be sure to carefully consider your project costs and select everything you plan to build to RCO as reimbursement or as match. For acquisition projects, most work types are collected at the property level. The three main groups are land, incidentals, and administration. Land metrics are straightforward. For instance, the type of acquisition and type of acres that you're acquiring. Incidentals are the largest group of metrics that you can choose from and include anything from cultural resources, appraisals, closing costs, and demolition, to name a few. Administration is your staff time and cost for administering the project grant. For restoration projects, work types and metrics are collected at the work site level. In general, the metrics can be more complicated for restoration projects due to the large variety of potential work types. The important thing to consider when choosing metrics for restoration projects is what reflects what you are doing, what best reflects what you're doing. For instance, if fish passage is the main goal and you're just replanting the disturbed area from construction activities, you would select fish passage, but not riparian planting. But if you're restoring fish passage and planting a 200 foot buffer along a quarter mile stream of your landowner's property, you would select fish passage and riparian planting. Please work with your lead entity coordinator or grants manager if you have questions. Once you select a work type, you'll be asked to enter costs and metrics associated with that work type. As Kay mentioned, we use metrics for all sorts of things. First, RCO uses them to track project completion. NOAA, our federal funder who provides uh, funds for surfboard, uses them in their reports to Congress. They are also used in the biennial State of the Salmon report. They are used by lead entities to track recovery progress and by RCO to help answer questions from state legislators. And even researchers will mine our database for information, so they matter. If you're uncertain of an exact number to use in the metrics, be conservative. It's better to guess low and deliver high than to guess high and deliver low. We will also provide a visual view of the application metrics pages during the live PRISM demonstration later in this presentation. Next slide, please. RCO requests specific information in the application regarding the project's potential impacts to cultural resources. Your responses to these questions are used to determine what risk your project poses to cultural resources and whether RCO should lead the cultural resource consultation process with Department of Archaeology and Historical Preservation and affected tribes, or if other agencies will take the lead on this process. It's important to provide a thorough account of all proposed ground disturbance, not just major activities, so that our cultural resources coordinator can fully understand what you intend to do and the extent and depth of planned disturbance in both the design phase and implementation phase of your project. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna go over a list of uh, required attachments, um, the most common types that you will provide as part of your complete application. I will not be covering every possible attachment type, so be sure to review the attachments required for your project type in Manual 18 and in the Appendix C application checklist. Next slide, please. First, a quick note about attaching attachments. It's actually really easy. On the attachment page, locate the attachment file and photo button. Once in the browse screen, you can browse for files on your computer, or you can just drag and drop files. They will load automatically, the easiest option. You can do multiple files at once, and you will be able to then choose attachment type and associate the files to a particular property or work site in the same window before uploading them. 
As you can see here, there are only certain types of files PRISM accepts, and there are size limits. If you have an important file that exceeds these limits and you cannot compress or reduce the file size, contact your grant manager for assistance. Next slide, please. PRISM requires a minimum of two photos. After uploading photos, we ask that you choose at least one photo to be the primary. This helps your most important photo stand out in PRISM application to the reviewers. To do this, click on an uploaded photo, then select the primary or secondary link on the photo. We ask that you choose representative photos of your project. Next slide, please. As part of your project, you will need to obtain a signed landowner acknowledgement form as part of a complete application. This form signed by a landowner simply acknowledges that they are aware the applicant is applying for funds to conduct a project on their land. It is not a legally binding contract requiring future participation. But it is worth noting now that if you have a restoration project and the project is funded, you will then need to obtain a signed landowner agreement for all landowners whose property involves restoration activities on their property prior to starting construction. The landowner agreement commits the landowner to the project for at least 10 years and identifies monitoring and maintenance requirements by either them or you, the sponsor. In some cases, you may have a landowner that is only temporarily involved in a project, for instance, granting a temporary access easement to the project site. In these cases, a landowner acknowledgement form is needed, but you will not need a landowner agreement. Some exceptions to the landowner acknowledgement form requirement and the future landowner agreement are when you're proposing a project on your own property, or known as sponsor-owned property. Assessments, inventories, and studies that cover a large area and encompass numerous properties do not require landowner acknowledgement forms either. And multi-site acquisition projects, which involve a large group of landowners, require at least a signed landowner acknowledgement form for the priority parcels. If your project is located on state-owned aquatic land, provide a landowner acknowledgement form signed by the Department of Natural Resources. Next slide, please. Every surfboard application requires at least three maps, a vicinity level map, a project level map, and an area of potential effect or APE map. Vicinity maps should show where the project is located from a recognizable regional perspective. It should include nearby towns, main roads, while clearly showing where the project site is located. The project level map should be zoomed in enough to show aerial photography detail to envision the restoration design or acquisition elements. In some cases, you may need more than one map to represent the whole map. To help make maps more consistent and easier for evaluation, please include the following on your map. Your project name and project number. Sponsor name or logo. A north arrow, labeled streams and an arrow indicating flow direction. A map scale and label any other identifying landmarkers, such as roads or other water bodies, if they're helpful. Clearly designate acquisition parcels using legal parcel layers and include landowner names if there are more than one. Next slide, please. The third type of map, or the AP map, is an important tool RCO uses to assess what risk your project poses to cultural resources. Please make sure you outline the entire footprint of all ground disturbance associated with your project. This includes planning projects with elements such as geotechnical or groundwater investigations. The rule of thumb is if it moves dirt, it must be reviewed. Due to the difficulties many have had properly formatting this map, RCO has produced and will be providing a template and instructions on correctly producing this map. When available, it will be found on the surfboard page of the RCO website. Sometimes, multiple maps of different scales may be necessary to show both the location of the project and what activities will occur there. And in that case, we recommend attaching a single document that contains all pertinent images. Next slide, please. Attaching all supporting documents such as maps, assessments, designs, and design reports from a previous phase is very important. If not all that pertains to this application or phase of the project, highlight what does. This helps to provide context and understanding of the goals, objectives, and design considerations of the project to the reviewers of your application, and is especially helpful if this application is part of a large multi-phase restoration project or acquisition project. We recognize that some projects may be very conceptual at the time of application. That's fine. If so, include sketches, examples, 
um, photos from other projects, anything to help convey your intent to technical and citizen reviewers. And remember, if you're applying for greater than $250,000 in restoration funding, RCL requires a preliminary design as an application deliverable. This includes engineered plan drawings and a design report. Please see Manual 18's Appendix D2 for detail on what is required as part of a preliminary design. Next slide, please. The cost estimate worksheet provides technical reviewers and grant managers a detailed overview of your project budget above and beyond what is allowed in prison application. It's important that you don't undercut your project. Part of being ready to proceed with your project work means you thought out a reasonable cost estimate, taking into account all costs. Project evaluators will look at your project to determine if you included enough in your cost estimate to complete the project. Remember that cost estimates should be reasonable, but if there is uncertainty of some costs, build it into those individual expenses where it is applicable. Do not just add contingency as a line item. And make sure your costs are clear and avoid lumping. For instance, labor and materials should be separate costs. Project management and permits and surveys should be individual line items if possible. Different design phases should be called out and itemized for their tasks and deliverables too. For administration, architecture, and engineering costs, also known as A&E, break out the various admin and design costs by staff, consultant, and or task. If your project is eligible for indirect costs, add those to the section specifically provided for indirect costs that is below the A&E section of the RCO template. And we do recommend that you use the cost estimate template we provide. It provides many useful categories, automatically shows if you've exceeded your A&E allowance, and compiles all project types into a well-organized total page if you are applying for a combination project. Next slide, please. Sometimes applicants of large projects may choose not to show their entire match, project match in prison to ease billing and provide flexibility. This is fine. However, it is important to communicate the total project cost to reviewers. The cost estimate worksheet provides a column for you to show this additional unreported cost. Next slide, please. When putting together your budget, keep in mind the allowable limits for A&E and administrative costs. A&E costs are architectural engineering expenses incurred for restoration grants, but also include direct costs associated with managing the project, like staff time. The surfboard limits these costs to 30% of the overall construction budget. Please consider if you request funding for a restoration project and already completed a considerable amount of design work, a full 30% request may be scrutinized more closely. Administration refers to the administrative costs associated with land acquisition or an acquisition project. This includes staff time managing the project, contracting, reviewing incidentals, and legal fees. This is limited to 5% of the land cost plus incidental cost for each property. Next slide, please. The authorizing, the authorizing application form is required from sponsors at the final application due date. This form requires the sponsor's governing organization to specify and approve through resolu resolution who has a signing authority for official documents associated with surfboard grants, such as project agreements and amendments. Due to the time it can take to organize a meeting for a formal resolution with your governing board, it is important to not procrastinate on this form. Not completing this form on time could potentially lead to an ineligible application. If your organization is a tribe, please reach out to your grant manager before completing this form as the requirements for tribes have changed. Next slide, please. All applications must also include a fiscal data collection sheet. RCO uses this form for financial and federal reporting. This form provides information regarding the indirect rate you intend to use if your surfboard grant has federal funds, recent financial audits of, audits of your organization, and general financial information for your organization. Typically, this type of information is housed with your bookkeeping staff or accountant, so plan for the time it takes to acquire this information or for them to complete it. My name is Brandon Carmen, and I'm a grants manager working with sponsors in the Chehalis Basin. Today, I'm going to provide an overview of the surfboard grant requirements and highlight some topics important for sponsors to understand. Next slide, please.
First, let's talk about grant match. We've already talked a lot about match, but what is it? Match is your share of the project costs. If a cost is eligible for reimbursement and is within the budget and scope of your project, it is also eligible as match. It's important to note that except for some exceptions, surfboard projects are generally required to provide at least 15% match and your build expenses will be reimbursed commensurate with your match obligations. Next slide, please. Match can come in many forms and may include equipment purchases, land donations, staff and or volunteer labor, project materials, or from other professional services or sources of funding. You should also remember that other surfboard and PSAR projects are not eligible as match, and the same goes for some other RCO programs such as Triple F 2P and the WWRP Farmland Program. If you have any questions about a cost being eligible as match, do not hesitate to ask your grant manager. Also, I would be remiss not to mention that if your grant match must be spent prior to your RCO uh, project being awarded in September, your project may not be eligible. If this is ever the case for you, consult your grant manager as soon as possible. Next slide. Now let's talk about getting paid for costs incurred through your project. It's important to note that surfboard only provides reimbursements, meaning that in order to receive funds for an action or service in your project, you must have already paid for these costs. Once a sponsor invoices RCO, the billing will be reviewed and if approved, reimbursements for out-of-pocket expenses will be issued. We also recognize that the success of some projects hinge on the sponsor's ability to initiate work on a project before an agreement is issued. Costs incurred before executing a project agreement are referred to as pre-agreement costs and may be eligible for reimbursement with prior, prior approval from your grant manager. If you anticipate seeking eventual reimbursement for pre-agreement costs, we strongly encourage you to communicate this early and often with your grant manager. Some common examples of pre-agreement costs we see are property acquired under an RCO waiver, design or engineering costs, or construction materials. Next slide, please. What are cultural resources? Cultural resources are any culturally significant sites or objects important to Native American tribes and the state of Washington. If these sites or items are destroyed, they are irreplaceable and a piece of culture is lost. Examples of these resources include shell middens, pictographs or petroglyphs, cult culturally modified trees, burial sites, stone tools, homesteads, farmsteads, mining sites, or other areas with evidence of past human use. To encourage the preservation of these resources, they are protected under both state and federal law. State protection is provided under Executive Order 2005-05 and federal protection is provided underneath section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Cultural resources can be found anywhere, but are especially common on river shorelines as well as the edges of Puget Sound. Because salmon recovery work almost always occurs in these areas, it's important to be aware of them and plan for their presence as part of your project. Compliance with cultural resources and mitigation in their presence can incur significant costs, so plan your project and budget accordingly. Next slide, please. A critical part of your surfboard project is to ensure that cultural resource review is done properly. This review is required before any ground disturbing activity can, can occur and a notice to proceed has been issued. Depending on your match source, you have three possible avenues for completing cultural resource review. Cultural resource review may be administered through a federal agency, through a state agency besides RCO, or through RCO your grant manager will communicate the path for your project. At the time of your application, you should have described any ground disturbing activities planned for your project, such as geotech, demolition, any restoration activity, planting, or other ground disturbing activities. These descriptions, as well as maps showing your potential areas of effect will determine if a cultural resource survey is necessary, if an archeologist needs to be present during construction, if any mitigation activities need to be planned for, if you need to obtain a special permit, or if you need to produce an inadvertent discovery plan. Again, these costs can add up and because these actions are required, we advise you to seriously consider them when putting your budget together. Next slide, please. 
Working on public lands, we've funded some excellent restoration projects on public land. Sometimes these restoration projects are proposed by the state agency landowner themselves, and other times the project is led by another partner. Be sure to include the agency's real estate staff early in your planning process to ensure that your restoration proposal is compatible with other required uses and that they allow you permission to do the work. Many of our county, city, and state-owned public lands were acquired with funding, some of which flowed from RCO, to further a particular type of use like hunting, hiking, improving waterfowl habitat, or some other uses like team sports. Agency, agency habitat biologists or watershed stewards may not know all the, all the title encumbrances or other restrictions necessary to take into consideration. So consulting with the agency's real estate staff will be key to ensuring your project is completed smoothly. As with any, as with any project, you must also ensure you obtain a landowner acknowledgement form. Next slide, please. If you would like to propose an in-water restoration project, for example, a project occurring on a river, lake, or tideland, you will need to coordinate with DNR, the agency responsible for managing Washington state-owned aquatic lands. State-owned aquatic lands lie under navigable water, so how do we know if a water body is navigable? Well, this is not always a simple question to answer, as it has to do with which waters were navigable as statehood. If your project involves restoration of marine waters, including tidally influenced river reaches such as the Pacific Coast, Strait of Juan de Fuca, Puget Sound, or Hood Canal, then it's on state-owned aquatic lands. If it includes in-water work on major rivers such as the Nooksack or the Columbia or major lakes like Lake Washington, then it is on state-owned aquatic lands. Where the definition of navigable becomes confusing is for smaller rivers, human altered shorelines, or streams. You must ask DNR. We suggest erring on the side of caution and always consulting the DNR aquatic lands manager responsible for the area you are working in. Many of our sponsors routinely work with DNR to secure manual 18's landowner acknowledgement form when they plan in water work. In addition to the acknowledgement form, you will also need to obtain legal authorization to work on state-owned aquatic lands, such as obtaining a use agreement, right of entry, or an easement. Next slide, please. Implementing your project. It's important for you to remember not to break ground or begin construction until a project agreement has been signed and you are in compliance with any special conditions the project may have assigned. You have secured site control and tenure with a landowner agreement. You have completed cultural resource consultation and the notice to proceed has been issued and permits are in hand. Any restoration work done prior to completing these actions are ineligible for reimbursement. Next 